The United States' position since 2001 has been that there's a state of armed conflict between the United States and Al-Qaeda. And if you are part of Al-Qaeda, um, you are a target. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, targeting U.S. citizens for death in wartime, how the government decides. When al-Qaeda operative and U.S. citizen Anwar al-Awlaki was killed by a CIA drone strike in Yemen, a critical question was raised. Can the U.S. government legally target and kill an American citizen? And the answer is yes. A 2001 statute, the Authorization for the Use of Military Force, stipulates that under certain conditions, the government can take such action. Legal expert and senior fellow Benjamin Wittes explains. Here there was a deliberate decision to target a specific American citizen, not, you know, a German position. There are a lot of soldiers there and one of them turns out to be American, but to go after him in particular. And that does raise some very unusual issues, starting with um, certain international law issues, but w with respect to that would those would be true whether he was a citizen or not. But um, with respect to the citizen in particular, you have some very speci very particular issues related to what due process rights a U.S. citizen may have before he's targeted with lethal force overseas. Let me make sure I understand. So the answer to the question about the drone strike and about this man's due process lies in the 2001 statute, the Authorization for Use of Military Force. What does this statute do? It's the governing statute of the entire overseas military operations with respect to U.S. counterterrorism right now. And it um, authorizes the use of, uh, quote, all necessary and appropriate force, unquote, against uh, those entities responsible, those entities, individuals or countries responsible for 9-11 in order to um, prevent further such acts. Well, okay, Ben, then apply it to Anwar al-Awlaki's particular case. The question for purposes of somebody like Anwar al-Awlaki is twofold. One is, is he meaningfully part of AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula? Um, in which case, and, and the government clearly concluded that he was. Um, and then the second question is, is AQAP meaningfully part of Al-Qaeda, which would bring it within the ambit of the authorization for the use of military force? And so the government's logic is that this is a guy who is part of al-Qaeda through its Yemeni arm, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, operationally active. Um, there is no, because he's in Yemen, in a remote you know, part of Yemen, capturing him is not feasible without undue risk to either of either collateral damage or risk to forces. Um, and so for purposes, of, he's clearly within the AUMF and you can't get him by more conventional means. You can't capture him. Um, and so he becomes at that point a lawful target. One of the things that the administration was largely criticized for in this process was the lack of transparency. Is that justified? There's two issues. One is whether you release more intelligence about the operations themselves. On that point, you know, there are a lot of reasons why you often can't, um, protecting the intelligence sources that by which you acquired the key information, for example. But I see no good reason why the legal basis of, for these strikes is not much more public than it is, much more discussed in much more detail than it has been. I don't think it should be a state secret that we have a CIA drones program, which everybody knows, or the sort of people that we consider lawful targets for that program, or the legal basis for the operation of the program and what we regard as the relevant legal standards. I think all of that stuff should be public. And I find it, frankly, bewildering that given the magnitude of the administration's reliance on this program, which is extreme, um, that they do not 
come out and talk about it and defend it with pride. We just marked the 10-year anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Osama bin Laden, the head of al-Qaeda, is dead and the organization is arguably splintered. Is this statute still viable? I think the AUMF is long overdue for a rewrite. Um, and I, I think the groups that we're confronting right now have some of them a very tenuous connection with 9-11. And I would like to see the AUMF authorize the war that we're actually engaged in now rather than the war that we were engaged in 10 years ago. Core Al-Qaeda today is, is very significantly degraded. There are these spin-off groups in various parts of the world, particularly Yemen and Somalia, that are enormously active. Having an authorizing statute that clarifies um, what our relationship with those groups is going to be would be a very healthy thing. What are the moral or ethical implications here? When you're dealing with somebody like Alalauki, who, you know, we know counseled um, the underwear bomber, we know counseled the Fort Hood shooter, and we know was in touch with these, you know, London-based cells that. Um, that were quite operationally active, you, you do have to ask the question whether, you know, whether too much solicitude for his well-being comes at the cost of a lot of other people's well-being. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your BlackBerry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu slash mobile.